All right, so we're at the end of the study of Colossians. If you had a chance to dig into your homework this week, you probably saw that there was this big list of names of people, and it's like, hi, tell this person I said hi, and this person says hi, and, and if, if you're anything like me, you're kind of like, skip, okay, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> But as I looked at this list of names, I was like, Lord, what am I supposed to teach on? Like, there's a list of names. And then you start looking at all the names, and you kind of dig into who these people were. It says Tychicus was faithful, and Onesimus, he was, like, redeemed. Like, he, was, he failed, and God restored him. And Nympho was generous. And you start thinking, oh, my goodness, there's, like, 15 different messages in here. Uh, but as I kind of prayed to the Lord about, all right, what, what would you like me to teach on our last day? He actually brought me to what I would say is kind of a harder topic, but we're going to dig into it because he pointed me to Colossians 4.10, where John mentions, or not John, um, where Paul mentions Mark. He says Mark is with him. And for him to say that Mark was with him means that their relationship that was, uh, there, there was a break in their relationship. We're going to dig into that in a little bit. And God restored the relationships. So today we're going to talk about forgiveness and reconciliation, and my hope is that it's going to bring hope to you in your relationships. Uh, so how many of you have siblings? Siblings? You don't have siblings? Or maybe if you didn't have a sibling, you had like a best friend that you grew up with, and then sometimes with your best friend, you, you would get in fights, and then you would resolve your conflicts, and you would be fine. But siblings, I have, uh, I'm the youngest of four. And I have an older sister, she's three years older than me, and my older sister is the typical firstborn daughter. She takes care of everyone, and she tells everyone what to do. And <laughs> so, as we were growing up, she was constantly telling me what to do and correcting me, and in my head, she got away with everything, and I always got in trouble, but I'm the youngest, so it was probably actually reverse if it's anything like the way I parent. But um, <laughs> she, I remember, this was probably like seventh grade, and her and I fought a lot, now we're best friends, but probably seventh grade, she came up to me, and I don't know, I don't remember what she did, but I was like, you know what? I am bigger than you now. Like, I'm two inches taller than her. By the time I was in seventh grade, I was the height I am now. I was like, I don't think so. And it ended up like some, I don't even know what happened, I'm pulling here, whatever, but it ended, it ended when I threw a frying pan at her. That's when it ended. Now, I think I threw it at her legs. She was fine. Everything was fine. But I think we just, we just learned, okay, this is not the best way to resolve conflict. I've learned. I've grown. I've, I hopefully resolve conflict a lot better. Uh, but my sister and I, we had our ups and downs, um, like most siblings. But, you know, we're together. Praise God. We've worked it out. She's my best friend. But I think for many of us, and including myself, we've had some conflicts that we've been unable to resolve, right? Maybe there's been a, a break in a relationship and you haven't seen someone that maybe at one point you were best friends with them and then now you haven't seen them in 10, 20, 30 years. We're heading into the holidays and probably a lot of us are thinking like, I don't want to sit around the table with that person. Like, I'm not going to be able to handle this. I can't be in the same room as them. Maybe I, I've, I've spoken with a lot of you, you're in blended families, and blended families are hard. And maybe you're the stepmom, or you're the biological mom, and the other person who's involved, who's maybe the stepmom, or she's the biological mom of, of the kids that you're, you're caring for, maybe she's saying some pretty nasty things about you, and she says bad things about you in front of the kids, and she manipulates situations. Maybe that's your situation. Maybe you're struggling with in-laws and just that tension and they're saying all these things about you again that aren't true. Coworkers who are just like gossiping. Um, we've all got those difficult people in our life that we've had conflict with. And the beauty is that because of everything we've learned in Colossians, because of the finished work of the cross, because of what God has done, there is hope even in those difficult situations and those difficult relationships. We can forgive and we can be reconciled to others, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So in our homework, we looked at our Colossians 4, 5 through 18. So we're going to quick look at Colossians 4, 5, and 6. It says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Be wise, make the most of every opportunity, have your conversations full of grace, seasoned with salt. 
Now, this verse is right after Paul in Colossians 4. He asked the church, pray for me that God will open a door for me to share the gospel. Pray that God would open doors for the gospel to be received, that the hearts would be pliable and ready to receive the gospel. And I think Paul's making a connection here, showing us that how we live, how we live will impact how people receive the gospel. Because Are they looking at us and thinking, oh my goodness, look at the way they handle conflict. I want that. They serve a supernatural God. They've been able to forgive through the hardest of situations. Or are they looking at us and thinking, goodness, they can't. They can't agree about anything. They're fighting over trick-or-treating, right? They're fighting over women in ministry. They're getting offended and leaving that church and then going to that church, and, and they're saying that there's this supernatural, powerful God, right? The way that we work through conflict will impact how what people see, and they're going to be like, wow, I want that. There's something different about them. They serve a supernatural God who can forgive and heal the greatest offenses and the greatest hearts and who changes hearts. So how we live and treat others shows the world that we are Christians. Jesus said that the world would believe in him if the church is one, right? He said that in John 17. Ephesians 4 tells us to like strive for the unity. It even tells us in in Ephesians 3.10, it says that our unity is a testimony to the principalities and powers of darkness of the power of God. And in order for us to live in that unity, we're going to have to learn to forgive and to reconcile with others. So we're going to look at Colossians 4.10 and see what Paul says about Mark. So he says, my fellow prisoner, Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark. So Mark sometimes is called John, sometimes he's called Mark. I'm gonna call him John Mark. So throughout the rest of the teaching, he's John Mark. So he is the cousin of Barnabas. Mark is the same person who wrote the Gospel of Mark. So you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So Mark wrote that um, with Peter's help. So that's, that's the Mark that we're talking about, John Mark. And Paul shares that Mark is with him, and then he says, welcome him if he comes to you. So he's writing a letter of recommendation for Mark. So this is pretty huge. And to understand why this is huge, we have to go back to Paul and Mark and Barnabas' first missionary journey. So the first missionary journey, it starts off really, really exciting. So you've got Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark. They're working together. They're doing ministry together. They're super excited to spread the gospel. They're in Antioch, and they jump in a boat, and they head to Paphos. So I've got a map up here that I want to show you. We're just going to keep this up for a little while. So they're in Antioch. You can see they sail from there. You see the one, and they sail to the island, and they are in Paphos. So that's where they are, and there's like all this amazing, fun, awesome God things happening. It says in Acts 13, 17, the proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. And then when he saw what happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So this is like the governor. This is like this big shot guy at Paphos who's like, oh my goodness. So can you imagine that was you and you went out on a missionary journey and all these amazing things are happening and you're with your friends and the governor is like, tell me about this Jesus. And then he believes like, this is so exciting. And maybe some of you, you've been in a similar situation You've been working with someone on a new idea. You're just like so excited to start this new adventure, maybe a new business adventure, ministry. You're all in the same boat. You're all on the same page. You're working together. You're excited. You're staying up late designing logos. You're dreaming. Maybe it's planning weddings, brainstorming. Just like in Paphos, all these amazing things are happening. But then then there's a break, there's a conflict that causes one of in your party to separate. What we see in Acts 13, 13, so from Paphos, Paul and his companions, they sailed up, you see, to Perga there, in Pamphylia, and it says in Acts 13, 13, that John Mark deserts them there. So something happened from Paphos to Pamphylia, and John Mark leaves. So it's just Barnabas and Paul at that point. So everything's going great. All of a sudden, maybe you find out your friend's been kind of saying some things about you that aren't good. The person wasn't being honest. 
all of a sudden in your marriage, everything was amazing, and all you're doing is just nonstop fighting. Your in-laws are saying, like, th there's been a rift, right? There's been a break in the relationship, and there's a separation. So after two years, Paul and Barnabas, they decide they want to go back and visit the churches that they've planted. So they planted these churches. They say, we're going to go back, and we're going to visit these churches. We're going to go visit them. And Barnabas says, great, I'll go get John Mark. And Paul says, no, he's not coming with us. And Barnabas says, yeah, he's coming with us. And Paul's like, no, no way, no how. He's not reliable. He deserted us. He left. He is not coming with us. And so what happens is there's a separation. It says they had a sharp disagreement. They had a sharp disagreement, not just a small one, and the relationship split. And Paul and Barnabas, they are strong spiritual leaders, right? They're not immature Christians, but they had a parting of ways. And so what happens is Silas and Paul, they go north, and then Barnabas and John Mark, they go back, um, I think, down through, through the islands and then up. So what's amazing is God even uses those breakups, those conflicts, to continue to spread the gospel. But I'm wondering, have you been there in that situation where you're just like, I am not working with that person. I will not be in the same room as that person. I cannot stand that person. I have been there. I've been there. So Pastor Charlene and I, she's here today. She said I could share this story. For years, years, we had tension. I've known her since 2008. I've been working with her since probably, I don't know, 2010, 2011. And for years, there was just tension, tension, tension. And she was like, we're going this way in women's ministry. And I was like, well, I want to go this way. And she's like, I'm the leader. We're going this way. And it came to a head. There was actually one point where I, she doesn't know this, I blocked her on my phone. <laughs> This is, this, is how, this is how much tension there was. I literally blocked her, and I was like, I will not answer. It's like, if she texts me, then I don't even have to know, right? If she calls me, it just goes to voicemail. I'm just, I'm not going to see her. So this is, this, is, this is how bad the tension was, right? Don't worry, God convicted me. I got, I'm blocked within a couple days. You're, you're good, Charlie. <laughs> but that's how much tension there was. And she called me in one day into the office, and she confronted me on some stuff. And I'd love to say it. I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. But I was like, nope, I'm out of here. And I said, don't talk to me. I quit. I'm done. I, I had even at that point, I had been studying the unity of the church, so I knew how important it was. So I said, you just tell everyone that I'm too busy with my family, and I'm out of here, and I'm not talking to you again. And I walked out that door, and I said, I'm done. And I slammed the door. Now I'm still here. <laughs> You know, we worked through it. I'll share more, but we're going to get back to John, Mark, and Paul. Because here's what's really cool about John, Mark, and Paul. We, yeah, cliffhanger. We don't know the details of the disagreement between John, Mark, and Paul. We don't know the details. Luke, the writer of Acts, I'm pretty sure he knew the details. He does not tell us the details. And just because we know the details doesn't mean we're supposed to share the details. Right? We don't need to always share the details. And when we are working through conflict, whew, keep those circles tight. Don't go sharing with everyone every little thing and getting every single person's opinion. Now, I'm an external processor, so I'm like, i got to externally process this with someone. Well, I've learned I can externally process with God. Right? I can share with him. I've got safe person, my husband. He's, he's always on everybody. He was always on Charlene's side. He's always on everybody else's side, right? He's always helping me see the big picture. So he's a good person for me to externally process with. But you keep those circles tight when you're working through conflict. We don't need to go and share with everyone everything that's happened. So Colossians, it's written about 14 years after their disagreement, and now Paul is writing a letter of recommendation. He's writing a letter of recommendation for John Mark. So somewhere along the line, like, they reconciled. Somewhere along the line, and I don't think it was just like a, hey man, we're good, whatever, all good, you deserted us, all good, you didn't want me to go with you. No, I think they had to sit down, and they had to work through it, and they had to reconcile with one another. And what happens is, I think that, Paul and John Mark, they went from being like, no, I'm not going to talk with him. I'm not going with him. He's unreliable. I think they went to being like the best of friends. Because in 2 Timothy 4.11, it 
This is when Paul, like, this is his last letter. Paul knows, I'm about to die. He's in prison in Rome, and he says, only Luke is with me. Get Mark. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I want to challenge you. Just because a relationship is broken, it doesn't have to remain broken. It doesn't have to remain broken. They went from being unable to be together to being the best of friends. And that required forgiveness and reconciliation. And if we're to imitate Christ in all that we do, if we're to say that he is enough, then we need to be people who are known for forgiveness and reconciliation. There is a caution here. These are, these are two mature people. They are repentant people. It's harder if a person is immature, not repentant, not safe. But I do want to challenge us. We are called to reconciliation, and it is possible by the power of Christ in us. So I'm, I'm going to use that word reconciliation a lot, so I do have a definition for you. Because it's kind of like a big, it's a big word. So the definition says, biblical reconciliation is the process of two previously alienated parties coming to peace with each other. So coming to peace with each other. So we're going to spend our rest of our time kind of looking at what, what does it mean to forgive and reconcile, and what does the word say about it, and how is this possible in our lives? So Mark eleven twenty five gives us some helps here. It says, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Forgive them if you hold anything against anyone. This verse doesn't say anything about the offender asking for forgiveness. I think we've heard that a lot. I'll forgive them once they come to me and they say they were wrong. Then I'll forgive them. This verse doesn't say anything about that. It says that we are to forgive them. So as I've been studying forgiveness, Tim Keller, I was reading a book that he wrote on forgiveness. He calls this inward forgiveness. This is inward forgiveness. And he says this is the first stage of forgiveness. So we're going to talk about the two stages of forgiveness. And this is the stage of forgiveness that should always happen. Whether the person repents or not, we get to choose to forgive them. We get to choose to forgive them. But how do you do it? Especially when the person isn't repentant, they think, they think you deserved it, you're, you're scum, whatever. Like, how, how do we walk through that? Well, first of all, we have to know it's a choice, it's not a feeling, right? We're never going to feel. If we wait till we feel like forgiving them, good luck. We're never going to feel like forgiving them. It is something that we have to work through. It's a choice. But Romans 12 can be of some help to us. So Romans 12, 17 through 21 it says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So there's kind of three big things that we see from these verses. So the first thing, as we're working through Forgiveness. The first thing that we see from these verses is that we have to resolve not to get revenge. So resolve not to get revenge. The second thing we see is that we proactively show love. It says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And the third thing we see is allow room for God's justice or God's wrath. Resolve not to get revenge. Proactively show love allow room for God's justice. So first one, resolve not to get revenge. 
Have you guys ever, not me, I'm not, I'm not me, I haven't, I haven't struggled with this um, at all, but um, have you ever <laughs> been happy when something happened to somebody, something bad happened to somebody who hurt you? You've been like, oh, yeah, they kind of deserved it. They're living that way, so mm, they did this to me. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely struggled with that. Um, you don't really share it with anyone. You're just kind of like, you're just a little happy. Um, or maybe you've meditated on how you can get back at them. Like, you know, I, I'm going to hurt them like they hurt me. You, you think about that a lot. Uh, when we do this, we are playing right into the enemy's hands, playing right into his, his schemes. We've got to resolve not to get revenge. We have to resolve not to get revenge. We have to capture those thoughts. When you start thinking about, you know, what they've done to you and all that, you just got to capture those thoughts. You can go back to Philippians 4, thinking about what is pure and right and lovely and, and what builds people up. We got to think about those things. Man, when we're just meditating on that offense over and over again, it's just like scratching an open wound. We're just making it worse and worse and worse. So, as we're working through these offenses and these hurts, first we got to think, okay, I am not going to get revenge. It is, it is not my job to avenge this. So that's the first one. And then secondly, proactively show love. Maybe one way you can proactively show love is just pray for them. Maybe you're not seeing them, you're not in any kind of relationship with them, you pray for them. So my husband literally right now, and I am going to share these details because I don't want you to think it's anyone at church. Um, he has this thing, at, he hunts out of state, and so he's got this awesome hunting land that he got permission for, and the neighbors hate him. They hunt and they hate that he has permission. So they have said the most nastiest things about him. He's been dealing with this for like six years. And they actually convinced the lady who has given him permission not to let him hunt this year. And so he has had to work through that. Actually, he, he, he ended up calling her and she was like, well, I guess there's always two parts to a story. And he got it back. But he said it was hilarious because he had to resolve not to get revenge. I'm not going to, you know, he's texting with this guy, whatever. And he's just like, oh, I'm so mad at this guy just saying all these things about me and all these lies. And then he's passionate about hunting. So that was very hard for him to know that he lost his spot. So he just said he had to work through that process. And he just started praying for the person who was saying all these things about him. And then he just said, it's, it's not mine to try to avenge. I'm, I'm going to proactively show love. I'm going to leave room for God's wrath. And then he said an hour later, the lady called him and was like, oh, actually, no, they're wrong. You can hunt here, right? Like, but he had to work through that. And he's still working through that with that guy. And I'm like, are you praying for him? He said, yes, I am praying for him. He's saying awful things about him, but you pray for them. Because as you pray for them, it changes your heart towards them. So proactively show love. Don't speak ill of them. Pray about them. Encourage them. And then the last one, allow room for God's justice. Or it says in Romans 12, God's wrath. Either Jesus Christ paid for their sins on the cross, or they are going to spend eternity suffering for their sins. And when you start to think about that, oh man, that gives you a heart for them. That gives you a heart where you're like, I pray that they would repent before the Lord. So let's be sure to go back to these steps of Romans 12 when we're working through forgiveness. Resolve not to get revenge, proactively show love, and then leave room for God's wrath. He says it is mine to avenge. So that's the first stage of forgiveness. Now this stage must always happen. This happens whether the person repents or not. But there is a second stage as I've been studying forgiveness. There is a second stage that I just wish this stage just didn't exist. This stage can just go away if you ask me. But it is a biblical stage of forgiveness. So we're going to work through that. And that stage is reconciliation. So Luke 17, 3 through 4, it says... If your brother or sister sends, sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. And if they repent, you see that? Forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. And then Colossians 3.13, it says, Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. This is huge. Forgive how? As the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Ephesians 4.32 says the same thing. 
And as I've been studying forgiveness, I've spent about a month just reading on forgiveness and studying forgiveness, I've really seen that forgiveness does include a second stage of reconciliation. And as I was studying that, you can literally see in the books that I've been studying, the first time I read that, I put a big old question mark and I circled it because I don't agree with it. I think forgiveness is that we forgive, right? We do what I just talked about. That's where, what I've always believed forgiveness is. It's this inward forgiveness. But it's taken me a month. I'm going to give you 10 minutes, right? So stick with me. If you're like, I-, I don't agree with you, that's okay. But I want to tell us that I believe after studying this that there is a component to forgiveness that includes reconciliation when the person repents. Because we are to forgive as the Lord forgave us. And God, when God forgives us, there is always reconciliation. There is always reconciliation when God forgives us because God forgives the repentant. And why does God forgive, right? Because if forgiveness is only stage one, if forgiveness is only stage one where there's this inward forgiveness, then what I'm going to think the purpose of forgiveness is like for me to let go of bitterness, right? That's the purpose of forgiveness. But does God have to let go of bitterness? If we are to forgive as God forgives, forgive as God forgives, the purpose of forgiveness is restoration. It's reconciliation. That is a biblical purpose of forgiveness. And if we are called to forgive as God forgives, it's not so that I can feel better. That there is a component to that, right? There's a component to that where we forgive and we're able to just let go because we're trusting that God is working through it. But it is also coming together. It is also reconciliation because we are called to forgive as God forgives. And there is absolutely no time in the Bible, there is no time throughout all of history that God has forgiven someone and has not been reconciled to them. If you are forgiven by God, you are reconciled to him. You are in relationship with him. So this type of forgiveness where it's just this stage one inward forgiveness, this is what people are calling therapeutic forgiveness. It's self-focused. It's focused on self. It cheapens God's forgiveness. Man, forgiveness, our forgiveness came at an extremely high cost, right? Jesus went to the cross and died for our forgiveness. We don't ever want to cheapen God's forgiveness. Biblical forgiveness is motivated by love of neighbor. That's why it's motivated by love of neighbor, not, not so that I can like let go of these things. It's motivated by love of neighbor and love of God. It is for God's glory and our joy. So I want to look back at Luke 17, because this is what it says, and I hate that it says this. It says... <sighs> If we are sinned against, we have to confront the person. Matthew 18 says the same thing. No. I say, no, if I'm, if I'm sinned against, that person needs to come to me. Why do I got to go to them? Because forgiveness is about restoration of the community. It's about bringing the person back into the community of God so that the world can know the power of our great and amazing God. See, I, I would much rather just work through what I, the inward stage and, you know, Romans 12 and work through that and just, we're good. We're good. I got to confront this person? Are you kidding me? Man, because if we don't do that, that kind of just inward forgiveness, that kind of forgiveness discourages healing in Christian communities. We want to have healing in Christian communities It makes it way too easy for people to distance themselves from those who have offended them rather than going through that difficult work of reconciliation. We should truly be known by our self-sacrificing love for one another, not our ability to like leave a church and go to a new church or in different ministry and start with like a clean slate and different people, right? We should be known by our ability to work through some stuff. Now remember, this is if the person is repentant, okay? I'm not saying you're supposed to be reconciled to somebody who's saying, you deserved it, I don't care about you, none of that. I'm not not saying that, but I do think we've got to consider that we are called to go to the person, and then it says, and then if they repent, you forgive them, and you work through that process. Also, another thing to note as we're talking about this, 
when God forgives us, because if we're going to define biblical forgiveness, we want to look at how God forgives. That's how we should get our definition of what forgiveness is. When God forgives us, there are still, like, there's still consequences here in this age, right? There's still natural consequences here in this age. So if you're working through a process of forgiveness and the person is repentant, that doesn't always mean that you're going to be like, you know, tight, 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 right? It could be that, okay, we're at peace with one another, but we're not best friends. Um, it could be that my kids don't see this person because of, you know, how awful what they did. So please remember there are always consequences. I'm not saying put yourself in unsafe situations or any of that. See, when, when Charlene confronted me, so, so Luke 17 says you have to confront the person. So when Charlene confronted me, I did not repent. I did not repent. I stormed out on her because I thought I'm just gonna leave, right? I wanted to just start over with a clean slate with a different set of people. I really wanted to leave the church. I was really just praying that God would like God, like, isn't there a job for my husband in Montana? I always wanted to go to Montana for some reason. I just prayed that over and over again, like something. Like, because I can't leave this church without there being drama, right? Like, everyone's going to be like, why'd she leave after 15 years? And I can't lie about it. So I just was hoping, like, I could just have an excuse, you know, just, God, just give me the easy way out. Well, man, God just, he convicted me. And what Charlene did is she, I just remember she texted me, I am ready to talk when you're ready to talk. I'm ready to talk. She proactively loved me, just like Romans 12 said. She could have been like, I don't want that girl on my team. That girl stormed out on me. She said I quit. She blocked me on her phone. Like, I, why would I want that girl on my team? That's what she could have said. But she fouled Romans 12, and then she pursued reconciliation even when I stormed out on her. And what happened is I came back, I apologized. Remember, we had about a week where we didn't talk, and I prayed through that, and God just showed me, Janelle, man, you are called to submit to her leadership, right? Stop trying. This is what I want to do. This is, no, 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 no. You just, you need, I'd call her, and I called her, and I was like, I am sorry, I am not going to try to do all the little things that I think I want to do. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going to submit under your leadership. And I can tell you what, that was four years ago. That was four years ago. And she is my, I mean, she's my spiritual mom. She's my best friend. I get to do every single thing that I ever wanted to do, I'm literally doing now, right? Like she knew, no, you're not ready for these things. The church isn't ready for these things. I needed to learn to submit and follow her leading. And Man, that happened because I resolved to actually work through the conflict. Everything in me, just, oh, I want to just quit serving children's ministry. I'll just, whatever, you know, and you should work in children's ministry, but that's not where I'm called. But, <laughs> but man, I learned so much. I learned so much through working through that conflict. And I am so thankful that I worked through that conflict. And I think that we... I think we've just been really greatly influenced by the outside world. I think we've just been told like you just gotta feel better and it's just about you and it's not about anybody else and focus on self. And we're told forgive because it's gonna get rid of your bitterness and it's gonna make you feel better and it will. But that's not the ultimate goal. We are to forgive as God forgives. If the ultimate purpose of forgiveness is restoration of the community, then we got to work for restoration of the community. And I, I think the reason why like, there's been such a focus on just inward forgiveness is because there's been some really bad teachings on forgiveness, right? There's probably been some really bad teachings. My, my poor sister-in-law was told she had to stay in an abusive marriage for years and years because that's just what you do. You submit, you forgive. No, no, right? That's, that's an awful, way too far teaching. So what we've done is we've like swung it the other way and been like, forgiveness is just in the heart and you never have to see the person anymore and you never have to work through hard things. And what I'm trying to do is bring us back to a biblical definition of forgiveness. Big shift, right? We want to just have a biblical, biblical definition of reconciliation and forgiveness. Every situation is unique. When we talk about maybe some consequences that are going to come from the hurt, from the offense, every single situation is unique. It will require spiritual wisdom and discernment. I would say if you're working through some things and you're trying to figure out, okay, this person, they've repented, what does reconciliation look like? I would say spiritual wisdom, discernment, look through scriptures, helps from pastors, spiritual leaders, 
all of that, right? We're not saying, oh, you, you know, that person repented and they were abusive for 20 years. We're not saying stay, no, we're not saying stay in that marriage. That's not what we're saying. We're saying get spiritual wisdom, discernment, help from a pastor, work through it. The Holy Spirit will lead you in that. So I do think we need to consider that perhaps we have decided that the consequences include an inability to reconcile when God says, I desire reconciliation. And I'm wondering, have we, the church, minimized what God can do in our hearts and the hearts of those who've hurt us? Do we believe, God, you can rebuild trust in my marriage? Do we believe, God, that you can rebuild that trust in our friendships with our coworkers? Goodness, I know somebody who just had the most horrific things happen to her and just could not see this person abuse all of that. It was within families and then families not able to see each other and it was just hard and difficult. But then God was able, the person was repentant and it took time, right? It took time for, for her to be in the same room as him. It took time. That trust had to be rebuilt. But God did that, right? God changed her heart. God changed his heart. And he brought reconciliation. He can do it. He can do it even in these greatest of offenses. So here's my challenge. Three questions. One, am I withholding forgiveness? Ask yourself that. Have I gone through stage one of forgiveness? This person's unrepentant, can't talk to them. Have, have I gone through that stage one of forgiveness? Have I chosen to forgive them? Or am, am I trying to get revenge? Am I holding on? Am I proactively showing them love? Ask yourself that. Two, is there someone I need to confront? They, they've hurt you. Right? Sometimes we ought to let things go. I'm not saying every little thing, but you know, you're praying about it and you're really, really hurt. Do you need to go to them and say, hey, this really hurt? Like you, you sinned against me in this way. Is that something you need to do? That, that's hard, you guys. I think some of us, maybe that's easy. Like we'd rather confront them but not forgive. Whereas me, I'd rather forgive and never confront. So if I confront you, you know I love you. Like, I love you because I don't want to do this, right? But it's because forgiveness and reconciliation is for restoration of the community. We're not confronting them for us. We're confronting them for them so that they can be built up, so that they can grow, right? Charlene confronted me. She didn't confront me for her. She confronted me so that I could be all that God created me to be, right? I had to work through some stuff. So accept it. If you get confronted, don't be like me and storm off. Pray, okay, Lord, help me to see this, right? Don't be defensive. Don't blame shift. Don't be like me. All right, number three, have I chosen to put up a wall against an offender when reconciliation is possible? They've repented. Reconciliation could be possible at this point. Have I chosen to put up a wall? Pray about that. I'm not saying come to me. I'm not saying you gotta come to me with all your reasons why. Ask the Holy Spirit, what does that look like? Go to him, look through scriptures, look through um, Ephesians 4.32, Colossians, Matthew 18, Luke 12. Look through those scriptures to kind of see what does that look like to forgive as God forgives. And now whatever situation you're thinking about, if you found out that person's child died, if you found out they had cancer, just worst case scenarios, their house burned down, would you reach out? And if you would, I want to challenge you, reach out now. Reach out now. Reconciliation is really hard. It's messy. It's complicated. But the way we treat another, the way we fight for one another, will testify to the outside world of the power of our God. They will look at the reconciliation that happened in our marriage, that happened in our friendships. Goodness, I know two people who they were... Um, there was a divorce, so then two people who were the, the mom and the stepmom and men hated each other. Now they're like best friends. They're like posting pictures on Facebook, right? God did that. God brought that reconciliation. He can do it. He can do it for you. Believe that he can do it for you. He heals the most horrific hurts, and he gives us love for one another that is so completely supernatural. And my prayer is that the outside world would look at us and say, who is their God? Oh my goodness, I want that. And see, we can forgive because, guys, think about it. 
what, what has been done to us, what has been done to us, it pales in comparison to how we have offended our great God, the sins that were up against us. Matthew 18 in that parable, it talks about, you know, the parable of the unforgiving servant. It is showing us that what what we have done against God is just an incalculable amount that could never be repaid. It could never be repaid. And God is saying, because I have forgiven you, would you forgive others? God did not need to forgive us. He doesn't need to feel better about himself. He chose to forgive us because he desires to pour his love out for us. And he came to this earth and he paid an extremely high, costly price for our forgiveness so that we could be reconciled to him. And not only are we reconciled to him, he took all our shame, he took it all away. And he says, you're holy, you're pure, you're righteous, you're loved. And because of what I have done and because I desire for the world to know who I am for my goodness and my love and my mercy to be spread, I want to use you. I want you to be my vessel to bring my goodness. So would you work through forgiveness? Would you work through it because of who I am? So we're going to stand by singing all hail King Jesus because our God is great and he is mighty, and he has done miraculous works in our lives. And because he has done that, because he has, I mean, he has literally put his spirit within you. And because his spirit is within you, you can do really, really, really hard things like forgive the most unforgivable, the most hurtful offenses ever. So let's stand and let's praise our high, amazing God.